it, you've got to have a hard stomach, you really do. And it, but it's worth it. It's a wonderful feeling to, you know, to get there. But um, it's not always pretty, and it's not always easy, of course. But no. to find beauty in between everything, which I think I have the ability to do, and that's something I got from my mother because my mom is very attuned to beautiful things, and I grew up around her wonderful color sense and her love of nature. She used to rush me out of the door at five in the morning to say, there's a thrush in the backyard, you know, we have to go listen to this, you know, and, and we'd hold hands. I'd be like four years old and, you know, she, she can, you know, and, and then after that we'd be picking the lily of the valley in the woods that were growing low and, you know, and I think that kind of thing, mm. I, I definitely owe to her because I, you know, my ears perk to any bird and to all beautiful color that I can find anywhere in the city, I don't care where it is. And, and I love architecture, and I also like dif diversification. I like to see different cultures. I love to experience it's different ages. You know, it's all here. It is, it really is. So we don't really, you know, I think of having to travel to Morocco or <laughs> Holland or someplace for inspiration, but you're really, you know, yeah, my best friend is in Morocco right now. So You're not finding that to be an absolute essential. Oh, it Although will it can be. happen. It can happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to feel that itch. You know, I, I think India is big on the list for me. I've never been there, and I, I know I must go there. And mm -hmm. I know that with the colors, I think I'll just be nuts. Yeah. I, I would be amazed if you didn't come back influenced by it and not transformed by it. I don't, you know, I don't think it's, it needs to be that extreme, but I think it's yeah. one of those powerful experiences that uh, will influence anybody who goes there. Yeah, I, well, I've, lived, I've lived in South America, I've lived in Europe, and I've been all over both you know, uh, Europe and, and, and uh, South America, and I've traveled extensively to, to very odd places, Austra well, Australia and Haiti and, and everything, and then I stopped traveling for a while, but now I'm starting to feel that, um, now that I've become so intimate and nose to nose, and, and the book, the book is sort of a, a little bit of a love affair with New York, and I'm, I'm glad that it's written, and I'm glad that it's complete, because it completed me in a certain way, and now I feel like, you know, maybe I'll move to Paris. <laughs> maybe it's time, you know, to, to you know, I... I it, it is very much a love song to New York, because Kim is using a lot of her own photography in the book, and um, I think the images certainly feed back into the art and also into the product. Do you find any big difference between designing, let's say for the kids market as opposed to for um, us adults? As a paintbrush I feel no difference. I, you know, because I feel joy um, pushing a brush and squishing it in pigment for anything. And, you know, when designing for Spode, you know, I, I had a whole different kind of feeling. I knew what I wanted to do, but I I didn't pre-plan it. I don't pre-plan anything I paint, nothing mm -hmm. I paint. Like every template that they gave me, it was just sit down and leave me alone, you know, for hours and just paint and here it is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're giving you. Um, and, you know, with children's, well, with children's books and things like that and illustrations, I had a weird story with Scholastic, um, which I'll share. You know, I, this is Counting in the Garden. This is my first children's book. And um, basically it's, you're supposed to find it's a counting book, so for a very young age range. And the, the animals are hidden inside these very lush textile gardens, and it's kind of a little bit of a test for kids to point them out. But when I first published it, when I first submitted it to, Cla to Scholastic, um, the editor, who was quite rigid, said to me, um, you know, you've got to change like 30% of the book because, uh, first of all, there are no elephants in a garden. And I said, excuse me, you know, <laughs> uh, where's your imagination? Have you ever heard of Babar? You know, <laughs> how about in India? You know, kids don't care where elephants are. You know, this is the kind of, this is the kind of stuff you come up with, in, you know, in touch with. And this was after they had already gotten 10,000 orders on the book at a Miami, at a Florida book fair. So even after that, and even after, you know, they said, well, you know, if you don't change it, you know, no book. So I found that a little hard to take, but I have an elephant on the on the cover of my next book, which is, <laughs> which um, well, I, I think those are, <laughs> those, are the, those are the things that firm your resolve. Mm. That kind of um, <laughs> lack of imagination or people being in a box that they uh -huh. can't get out of. Exactly. But you've been able to negotiate your way. Survive. To the, 
survive but also flourish. <laughs> you know, you really are not somebody who's going to be in some very tight category. Um, mm. I think you're an absolute natural for the children's imagery, the Thank playfulness you. of it, um, the, the charm of it. You know, I think they, they're wonderful objects. Thank you. Well, it's a joy. I can't believe that, you know, I have these two sides of my life, one for the adult and the kids, because the kids is just so much fun. You know, I don't have any children, and, I, and it, it's really bringing forth for me, you know, uh, childlike feelings and, and joyful child feelings. Oh, you they're, know? They're, they're adorable. So. Do you have any product areas that, that you would like to explore where it just hasn't come up yet, or oh, yeah, where there, absolutely. there's some potential... New well, frontiers. we're looking for the right partner, the right dance partner with um, wallpapers because I, I have 7,000 textiles in my uh, collection at home that have never been seen and they're painted on silk or linen mm. and, and paper as well and so many of them would lend themselves to very wild wallpaper and I just can't wait to see this happen and, and we've navigated through and met with a couple of companies in England mm -hmm. um, whom we feel potentially might be the right ones, but we haven't yet found the right dance partner exactly. But we're getting closer, and that's a, that's one of my fantasies. And then fabrics. I, as well. I see them as huge. <laughs> Real, I mean, huge in scale. Yeah. Thank Maybe you. huge in sales too, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> no, there. I mean, we've seen papers that have gotten bigger and and much more lush and not conventionally scaled. Right. So I think I think it'd be a good fit. I yeah, hope you can yeah. find the right the right party. Yeah, we're being patient about it. We, okay. you know, some people have. You, again, you don't want to walk into a relationship with someone, a company who, you know, I I did meet with one British company who are very well known, and uh, the design director, you know, just immediately took over and said, "This is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to be," and and I knew I knew right away that we couldn't dance together because mm. you know it's a collaboration. Yes, it is. You know, and and. The vision is there, and if they start to cut you immediately in the first meeting and telling you, you know, this is how I see it, and this is what we want to do with it, and you don't agree, you should leave. You know. Yeah, it's, they're putting you in a subordinate position as the designer, right. and we know all about that. Right. You know, I a mean, lot. That, that's why a lot of designers are anonymous. Um, they're put in a certain position, and breaking out, as you know, is tough, but it worth is very it. tough. Yep. I wanted to uh, have enough time to do a Q&A, because I'm sure you have some questions that I haven't thought of, and, <laughs> uh, and that uh, I just have one final thing that I'd like to mention. The, um, any parallels? between the perfectionism of being a musician and the open-ended creative end of being a painter? Well, uh, you know, being a classical musician, you know, I, I end, my career ended playing for Leonard Bernstein at Tanglewood, you know, playing with uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal at the 92nd Street Y. I toured a around Europe with a trio and, you know, played in orchestras there. And I did, I, that was through the end. And, and having come from that kind of um, background. It sounds you, very, very disciplined. It is. It's very disciplined and being note perfect is what it's all about. I mean, yeah. it's not what it's all about. Being musical and expressive is what it's all about. But, um, you know, the classical music industry, it's very unforgiving. And my options as a flutist were that I would take auditions around the country for various symphony orchestras and, you know, to become the principal flutist of a symphony. And those auditions, which are held similar to the way actors have to, you know, deal with, with auditions, were held behind a screen. And you could play the same Stravinsky ex excerpt or, you know, Beethoven symphony or anything that they had asked for, you know, three or four times until you dropped a note. And then they said, thank you very much. We don't need you anymore. And that, to me, was just too dismissive. I knew I was, uh, I knew what I possessed as an artist, you know, as a musician. And I almost think that I, by, by having made the decision to move into the thing that I'd done my whole life also in between every concert, which was painting, to move in that, I just, it was, it was freedom. I had never mm -hmm. taken a class in, in painting in my whole life. I just sat with my mother at the kitchen table as I was growing up, looking over, you know, at her watercolors with envy and, you know, and appreciation. And um, 
to move in this direction. I became, I think one of the reasons I've held so tightly to it is because, you know, I, I didn't have an academic background in it. And, you know, I, I, I think that probably made me more passionate in some ways to, to stick closer to home and, and, you know, what I was always familiar with. And, and I feel much more freedom in this field than I did as a musician. And, and it's, it fits me better. I'm Aquarius. I need, <laughs> I need well, freedom. <laughs> Mr. Bernstein, after he allowed you to play, without his conducting you, proclaimed you an artist, and um, that didn't limit you to music. I'm very delighted to, to know. Uh, it, it seemed as though it was like a, a almost permission was. to be whoever you wanted to be right. in whatever medium you chose. Well, that particular story, which is in the book, um, when I had played for Leonard Bernstein and premiered his piece, which I had never heard before in my life, except for the night before the Boston Symphony had premiered it, and the next morning our orchestra, Tanglewood, was playing it, and I was assigned the principal flute position. And I went over to my teacher and I said, you got to be kidding. You know, I, I, this is, he's my hero. I have 15 minutes to learn this music, and I've never, you know, and, he, and, and you know, I have a rehearsal tomorrow morning in front of my, my god, and, and he, he said, Kim, you'll, you'll get, just go to the concert tonight, listen to the music, and you'll, you know, it'll, you'll be, ha be able to handle it. So the next morning, I went to the concert, and there was this flute solo that was about a three-minute flute solo in the middle of the symphonic work. And long story short, uh, you know, I was, I, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had to get a hold of that music immediately because if we made it through that far in the music to that point where that flute solo, that exposed flute solo, existed, and I didn't have it down, I would have felt horrible to not have played my best for my hero. So the next morning, I went right to that part in the music <coughs> before rehearsal and told and you know just sat with the part in the grass before we got in and then Bernstein came up on the podium and he said hey good morning everybody how is how did you were at the concert last night how many of you heard and people raised their hands and you know this is a new piece I just finished composing and uh, and then he just looks at me like boom like right in the eye flute what's your name <laughs> and I said uh, Kim you know I could barely remember and I just and he said we're going to start from the third movement um, with the flute solo. And, oof, you know, so I knew that at that moment I better damn well be note perfect. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I definitely, um, so what happened at that point was he said, I'm just going to start to conduct you through this passage. And, and when you're, and it's about 23, 25 bars long. It's about three minutes of just you playing, and I'll conduct you. It's tricky, tricky meter here, so you're going to need to follow my baton pretty closely. And so for the first four or five, six bars, you know, Bernstein was indicating the tempo, and I was following, and, and something happened to me. I just kind of forgot him, you know, and I just played as if I had known the music my whole life. It was like making love to this music. And, and he very, you know, inconspicuously just put his baton down, didn't, you know, stop me from continuing to the end of the solo. And he, then he said, uh, you know, and then when I finished, he parted this red sea of music stands to the flute section, and he grabbed my face, and he kissed me on the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you, Kim, are an artist. And it was at that moment in my life that, as a musician, for sure, that I knew that if I went to my grave, you know, the, the next day I would have been fine. Because <laughs> that, that, that sealed the deal for me as a musician. And it gave me permission, somehow, a few years later, it gave me permission inside 